Welcome to Mountain View. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're new or this is your church home, you can find everything Mountain View on our hub at mtnvw.org slash hub. There you'll find info on giving, life groups, and kids. If you're new or have a prayer request, make sure to click the connect button. Stay in touch during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Before service starts, we want to give you an idea of what to expect. We will begin by singing a few songs together with the purpose of glorifying God through praise and worship. The lyrics will be displayed and we invite everyone to sing along. Following our songs, one of our teaching pastors will share a message about the good news in a relatable way with the hope of growing our faith and understanding of God. Finally, we will take communion and sing again as a response to God's goodness. We also have programming for your kids and students throughout the week. You can find more information by going to mtnvw.org. Whether online or in person, we are so glad you're here. Let's get ready to worship. Let's stand and worship this morning. Fight for me, sing a little louder. Yeah, 
I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is How are you guys doing this morning? <laughs> Me too. Um, welcome to worship. Uh, a couple just things. Uh, there's some cards in the back of your chairs. One is a welcome card. If you're new here and you want to connect, fill out that stuff, put it in a box. Another one is a prayer card. So if you have something you want to celebrate with us or if you have something that you just want prayer for, um, it's a good way to connect too. And uh, a team will here will pray for you. Um, I wanted to share some scripture that's been on my heart lately. Um, it comes from Romans chapter 8, and it's just dealing with how much God loves us and how much he's willing to do to come and get us. Um, it goes like this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, let me just pray over us as we continue to worship. Lord, we just thank you. Um, we thank you that uh, no matter what we're going through, no matter how our minds might be speaking to us, um, whether it's in darkness or pressed down ways, Lord, we know that you are pursuing us, that you are cutting through that darkness. Um, God, that you won't be separated from us, that you refuse that. So we thank you for that today. And we just look for you in Jesus' name. Amen.
take our weakness you set your treasure in jars of clay so take this heart lord i'll be your As a result of your financial stewardship, we are able to teach children and students about Jesus. Through our regular weekend programming and special events throughout the year, we provide a safe, fun, and caring environment for faith to develop. Your tithes and offerings are an investment in the future. Thank you for your continued support. You can give by going to mtnvw.org slash give, texting the amount to the number on the screen, or by mail to 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway. Thank you for giving to Mountain View.
Hello, Mountain View family. How are we doing this morning? Good. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Woo. Yes. All right. It's hot outside, so that's all you know to do. I get it. We're so glad that you're joining us today. And those of you who are at home watching, we're glad you're with us. We have been in this really great series called Moving Out, and we're going to continue to move through Moving Out as we get uh, kind of toward the middle part of the book of Acts. Today, I want to talk to us about something that's a really important facet of the Christian life, and that thing is evangelism. How many of you guys have heard that word before? Evangelism. It's kind of a big, yeah, fancy word. It's you might have heard it in a different kind of context to maybe describe Christians or maybe a certain subset of Christians, evangelical Christians or evangelicals is maybe some kind of variation of that theme that you've heard before. But evangelism is just a really fancy way of saying sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. In word, yes, but probably more effectively in our actions. And what we come to find when you think about evangelism, especially in our modern context, it feels like in many ways it's harder now than it has ever been to share Jesus Christ with our world. There just seems to be so many barriers. There's these cultural tensions that are going on, and then there's political strife. We obviously, you can, I mean, you can't turn on the news without hearing about that. There's racial tensions going on in our world and our society, and it all seems to hamper our ability to get the good news out there. Like, we have it. It's right here. How do we get it out there? Oftentimes, I think, and you've probably experienced this as well, you know, we are having conversations with people, and then you kind of decide that you're not going to engage people in a conversation that might be deemed controversial, right? Because it's just not worth it anymore. Like, you don't want to do anything that's going to cause more harm or more tension in an already tense situation. And honestly, I get it. I, I really do. I, I, I totally get it. I think if you're being honest, you get it as well. Because we are human beings, and very naturally, as part of we choose the path of least resistance, right? So if I had to choose between being canceled or maintaining the status quo, status quo for the win. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's it. Because it's just easier. It's just easier to do it that way. And so I get, we have all these, these things, and they just keep piling on, and you feel the pressure from all sides. Today, I want to encourage you with evangelism that it isn't a dirty word, that there is actually a way that we can evangelize. I want you to know that evangelism isn't dead. God wants you to know that he is still on the move. He's still doing things. That the hurdles that we face today, they've been faced before. And that they have never stopped ever the message of Jesus Christ going forth into the world. Case in point, you're all here. It's a great living example. You're a living testimony that no trials or man-made hurdles have ever stopped the news, the good news of Jesus Christ going out into the world. And that we can indeed hold on to our faith and be bold in our faith. But I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to maybe rethink evangelism for a modern context. Maybe it's about working smarter and not harder. What does that look like? We're going to turn to the book of Acts for some clues on how we can be smarter about the way that we share this really wonderful good news with Jesus Christ. We are going to start in Acts chapter 10 and then bounce on into chapter 11. This is kind of a continuation or a part two of a message that Pastor Chris brought last week. It involves a guy named Cornelius, another guy that you know very well named Peter, there's some visions, there's a pig, it's like a whole thing. So instead of kind of recapping all that, I thought we would watch a Lego video that will tell you everything you need to know. Everybody take a look. One day, Peter had a vision, a message from God he could hear and see. Peter saw heaven open up and all kinds of animals were lowered down to the earth. A voice said, Get up, Peter, eat. But Peter was Jewish. His people believed these animals were unclean and not good for eating. So Peter said, No, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Then the voice said, Do not call anything unclean that God has made clean. Peter heard this message from God three times. He knew it was important, but he had no idea what it meant. Just then, three men arrived and the Spirit said to Peter, Three men are looking for you. Go with them for I have sent them. Peter met with the three men and found out that they were sent by a man named Cornelius, a powerful soldier. He wasn't Jewish, but he followed God and he wanted to meet Peter. So the next day, Peter went to Cornelius's house. 
Once he arrived, Peter was honest with Cornelius. He said, You know it's against Jewish law for me to meet with someone who isn't Jewish, but God has shown me I shouldn't call anyone unclean. So why did you ask me to come here? Then Cornelius told Peter the most surprising thing. Three days earlier, he had had his own vision from God. A man in shining clothes appeared to him and told him to invite Peter to his house. When Peter heard this, he said, I realize now that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on everyone who heard the message, even those who weren't Jewish. Peter was astonished and said, No one stand in the way of them getting baptized. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Peter thought he knew all about people like Cornelius. He thought Cornelius wouldn't be accepted by God because he wasn't Jewish. But after spending time with Cornelius, Peter realized he truly loved and obeyed God and that God accepted Cornelius and his whole family and everyone who chooses to follow Jesus. And that's the sermon. Have a wonderful day. All right. <clears> oh, <throat> uh, <laughs> you wish. Uh, okay, so very important story. You've got this Cornelius and vision thing going on, Peter and a vision. It's all kind of happening simultaneously. And so Peter sees these things that God's showing to him. Cornelius is told by God, you need to go find Peter and send some folks. So he does, <laughs> which is very interesting to me because these guys knock on Peter's door and he's like, you're supposed to come with us. And he's like, all right, which I would never do, but whatever. They went and then they go to Cornelius's house. Peter takes six people with him to the house. And when he gets there, Cornelius has gathered his family and friends to hear a message that God has for them through his servant, Peter. But this is the thing. Peter doesn't have a clue what he's doing. <laughs> he has no idea why he, he came and why he's there in Cornelius's house. So this is what happens in chapter 10, verse 27. It says, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Good, good question, good question. Because of the Old Testament law, Jewish people, according to Jewish people, folks that were not Jewish were considered unclean and kind of by extension unworthy. So when Peter enters Cornelius' house, he kind of addresses the elephant in the room right out the gate. He's like, hey, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing this because I'm a, you know, and you're a, you know, and so we can't you know, and it's that kind of a moment. And then he's like, so why am I here? So what am I, what is this whole thing? What is the whole point of me being here? But he also lets them know that he too received a vision from God that said that all God's creatures were declared clean because of Jesus. And sure, it came in the form of some pigs and some other weird animals, but the message for Peter was clear that God doesn't see a difference anymore between Jew and Gentile. And even though everyone was a little unsure about why God had brought Peter to Cornelius' house, why Cornelius had brought all these people, one thing was certain in this story. God brought them together. God brought them together. So for whatever reason, God had brought these people together. They were supposed to be together in that moment, which brings me to the first important piece when we are rethinking what it looks like to evangelize to our world. When you are sharing Christ with others, you have to say yes to God's leading, even if you're not sure why. A couple of years ago, uh, my family and I, we decided to go down to Arizona to visit some family that lived in the area. Some of those family members were my wife's um, elderly grandparents who lived there. The week of spring break that we were going to go just happened to coincide with literally the busiest week in the church calendar. It was Holy Week, okay? For those of you who know, that's like the days leading up to Easter. It is a very busy time. And I kept thinking the entire time during the trip, I should not go. I, I shouldn't go on this trip. I have, uh, there's so much going on. I, I mean, it was just out of my mind, trying to make sure all the pieces were put together. And it's that tension that you feel when like, you're trying to honor your family, but you're also trying to do your job, and you're trying to kind of make, and I'm sure you've experienced that in your life. And I just wasn't sure. And the whole time we were driving to Arizona, I kept thinking, this was not the right call. This was the wrong call. I shouldn't be here. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I've got a million things waiting for me at home. This doesn't make any sense. And it didn't make any sense until the last day I was there. We were at her grandparents' house, and we were sitting out on the back porch, and somehow... Everyone else had gone in the house except me and my wife's grandfather. 
And out of the blue, completely unprompted, he just asked me a question about eternal life. He just asked. He asked about if it was real, what it was going to be like. He asked if he would know his wife of over 70 years when he got there, if she would remember him as she was in the early stages of, of, of having some um, mental issues. And so we were in the midst of this moment. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I, had no, I could never, could never have seen this conversation coming. We had one of the most amazing conversations, and it wasn't until after the moment had passed that I realized that was the last conversation we were going to have because a year later he passed away. I will never forget that moment and that conversation, and I'm really glad that I said yes. I didn't understand why I was going, and there was a million reasons for me not to go, but that was enough. I was supposed to be there for that moment because God was trying to use me in a way, a way I couldn't fully comprehend and I never could have predicted. Saying yes to Jesus can change everything. So when you are sharing Christ with others, say yes to his leading, even if you're not even sure what that looks like. And that's going to happen a lot in our modern world and culture where you are in a situation and you're like, I don't know how I got here. I don't even know why I'm here, but I think I'm supposed to be here. So let God do what he does best in those situations. Let him lead you. Let him do the miraculous. Let him put the people in place where they're supposed to be. Just don't resist it because it's not what you want to do or it scares you. This is part of what it means to be bold in our faith, saying yes to opportunities and doors that you didn't even realize you needed to walk through because God is making things happen. That's what he does. He's on the move. And you never know when you're saying yes to God's leading is exactly what God uses to answer somebody else's prayer. So say yes. In the case of Peter, the reason why God brought him into Cornelius' house is quite simple. God wanted Cornelius' family and his household to know the good news of Jesus Christ, and Peter was going to be the vessel that he was going to use to do it. And this is what happens in chapter 10, verse 34. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Peter has preached a lot of sermons. It's mostly been to a primarily Jewish audience. Here he is with a primarily Gentile audience. And there are three really important distinctions between this sermon and other sermons that he's preached. The first is this. God shows no favoritism. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. That means everyone can come. That's good news for us, Gentiles. That's really good news. That means it's for all of us. The ground is level. He doesn't see one or the other. It's not an us versus them. Along those same lines, God accepts all people from all nations and all backgrounds and all cultures. And the overarching theme over all of this is that Jesus is Lord over everything. Everything. Then Peter goes on to summarize the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus in the following passages. He makes it clear that Israel was the tool that God was using to bless all the nations of the world with the peace of God through God's son, Jesus. You know, the older I get, the more I start to realize how I need to hold loosely to certain aspects of theology that we would call non-essentials of faith. Because they just, they cause unnecessary divisions, and we have a job to do, and a calling, and there's no need for internal bickering. But one thing I am certain, and that Peter is certain of as well in this moment, that all people, all people have the same one creator, and that all people are in need of a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And there is no hope of being saved without Christ, who is the Son of the one creator. That much I'm sure. That is certain. I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the message of Jesus Christ. All people, one creator. All people need a savior. That savior is Christ. There's your message. There it is. That's what it is. When sharing Jesus Christ with others, we have to make sure that we're answering the right question. 
Have you ever known someone who has had like a major like health transformation? Like they've just like just one day they were this and then they you know they've lost a ton of weight or they bulked up or all of those things. And you know you ask what you think is a very innocent question, right? You just go, "Hey, you look great. Uh, what's your secret?" Ooh, bad, bad, bad question, because here's what happens. You open up a whole Pandora's box of information that you didn't know you needed and, frankly, you don't want, and it just begins. And the answers are as varied as the hairs on your head. Notice I said the hairs on your head and not my head. They are varied, varied. Oh, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing the whole 30. No, no, I'm, sorry, I'm doing paleo. It's actually the Mediterranean diet. Eat like Jesus ate. It's fasting. It's souping. It's calorie counting. The new superfood is kale. No, wait, it's ginger. No, wait, it's avocado. No, wait, it's spinach. It's whole grain. It's no grain. It's all meats. It's no meat. You boil it, cook it, bake it, air fry it. You snort it up your nose, and then you work out for 10 hours a day carrying your children on your back. Be sure to get at least 15 hours of sleep a night, and above all else, don't be stressed or you have to start over. Okay, that's the moment. And you know what you do? You know how you respond? Exactly like that. You just walk away. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry I asked. <laughs> Guess I'm just going to stick with my Cool Ranch Doritos and prayer because <laughs> it seems to be working. That's what happens. You just walk away. It's too, mu it's too much. It's too much information. It's too much stuff. What started out as an innocent question turned into this laundry list of stuff that you were never, never in a million years going to even get to. You don't even know where to start. Oftentimes, when we share the gospel, we like to just skip right into the morality clause that we believe is necessary in order to achieve results before sharing with people the very simple fact that Jesus loves them and died for them so that he could save them. That's the message. Keep the main thing the main thing. Cornelius' family was not gathered in his house to receive a lecture from Peter about what they have to do to be Jewish. They were gathered to find out what they have to do to be saved. Do you hear the difference? It's an important one. Listen, we, those of us who've been Christians for a really, really long time, we understand this concept that love is a verb, right? It's an action word. So we understand that to love Jesus is to live a life that honors him. So things like holiness and things like righteousness and even where we should generate things like our worldview and even our sense of morals, that all stems from the love for Christ. But first, Christ. First, Christ. Let's have an answer to the why of Christ before we get into the how of Christ. How Christ's love compels us to live a life of holiness and righteousness. The why comes first. The why of Christ. Now, no sooner had Peter begun this excellent sermon and he started preaching, then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just like takes over <laughs> and does what the Holy Spirit does best and descended on these Gentiles in Cornelius' house before Peter could even finish his sermon. This is what happens at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even to Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Here's the really cool thing about the Spirit. When the Spirit moves, and it moves in a profound way like this, it does it to make it abundantly clear to everyone who is witness to it who is in control and who is not. It is not Peter doing the miraculous work. It's not Peter's words or even Peter's actions of showing up. It's God who does the saving. It's God who does the transforming. That's a really great, encouraging thing to hear when it comes to evangelism. It's not you who does the transforming and changing. It's God, and he'd like to use you. But it's God who's going to do it. The Spirit's going to descend. He didn't even get to finish his sermon. He didn't even finish preaching. And then the Spirit does what the, he's like, I'll take it from here. I got it. Thank you. And there it was. And the Spirit of God descended and did an amazing thing. This was such a powerful testimony to the six Jewish converts who had come with Peter that they described this moment as the Gentile Pentecost. You remember Pentecost way early on in Acts? Holy Spirit came down, tongues of fire, the whole thing. Everybody was speaking in all these languages. It was an amazing, miraculous moment. Same idea, but this time it's happening to Gentile believers. It's a big, powerful moment and something only a God can do and orchestrate. 
So Peter, after watching all this stuff take place, he sits down, he has a meal with these new Gentile converts, all's well that ends well, except then he returns to Jerusalem and he gets there and he is met with some opposition from, let's call it a legalistic subset of Jewish community, maybe that, who was a little less than thrilled that he ate with sinners. Like, they're not super thrilled about that. And here's what happens in chapter 11, verse 1. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, "Mm, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? What's your deal, guy? Like, what is happening? That was a big, 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 like, what are you doing? And you better explain yourself, which don't worry, Peter is going to do. There was this deeply held belief still that Christianity was like a subset of Judaism. And in order to become a Christian, you first had to become a Jew, and you had to practice and follow the law before you could follow Christ. And that was going to be a problem for Gentile converts because there were a lot of Gentiles who took some issues with some of the Jewish practices, namely circumcision. And if that's what it means to say yes to Jesus, then no. Then my answer is no. And that was going to be the response of a lot of Gentile believers. They were like, if that's what it takes, then I'm not interested. So this is a good thing for us to take heed and to understand. Don't put artificial barriers between people who need Jesus and Jesus. It's not first you have to be perfect, or first you have to do it like this, or first, none of those things. God has already removed all of the barriers, so why are you erecting new ones? He's already given us a straight shot and a clean path to Jesus Christ. Don't stand in the way of it. Don't let whatever it is that you think it needs to be stand in the way of people having access to God through Jesus Christ. It's very important. But it goes more than that and deeper than that because for a lot of Jewish converts, you know, not saying yes to some of the ways that they lived their lives wasn't just saying no to their religion. It was also saying no to their culture. Because those two things were were intertwined, their faith and their culture, they were so connected that to reject one was to reject all of it. And that was deeply, deeply offensive to them. Dare I say, us as well? To be clear, God does not see it that way. Faith in Christ is completely separate from culture. Completely separate. Because culture and trends change, but Christ is eternal. Cultures sometimes, maybe, might be aligned with the teachings of Christ, but more often than not, they're against. And this is the most important thing to hold on to. God never gave the responsibility to carry the banner of Christ to a culture. He gave it to a people. He gave it to a people. You and me, it is not the responsibility of the culture to set the moral tone, to follow after Jesus. It's our responsibility. It's our cross to bear. It's our banner to wear. It's ours. We're the people. We're the church. It's supposed to be us. Keep the main thing the main thing. So Peter goes on to make a defense for what he did. He basically recaps all of chapter 10 right here in chapter 11. He goes on, defends his actions. He retells the entire series of events that led him to be eating in Cornelius' house with Gentile converts. He focuses on three important things. The vision he received from God. I had a vision. It was crazy. You're not going to believe it. The Spirit's prompting. Then the Spirit moved. And then the word of the Lord, he says, then I recalled the word of the Lord when Jesus said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Spirit. And as a conclusion of all those things, Peter says in verse 17, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Good and fair question. And when they heard this, they had no further objections, Your Honor, and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Because opposition to Gentile converts at this point, at this point in our story in Acts, is an opposition to God. He's made it abundantly clear through multiple channels and multiple people, and now it's Cornelius and his family, that this is the plan, that God is doing a new thing He's doing a new thing, and that new thing includes the Gentiles. 
And here's why that's important, because if Christ is going to be the Lord of all people, then his church has to include all people. It has to include all people. People you like, people you don't like, people you agree with, people you disagree with, people you would never associate with, and people that you love to death. It has to include all people. All of them. If he's the Lord of all, then our church has to be a reflection that Christ is Lord of all people. Which means evangelism can't be specific or targeted to just the people that you like. And this is the other part of that being bold thing, that just saying yes, even if you're not 100% sure why. When you do that, oftentimes God puts you in situations that might be a little uncomfortable, or you're not even sure how to respond. And isn't that the whole point? So that the Spirit can do what only the Spirit can do? And turns an atheist into a convert? And he's going to happen to use you as the conduit for which that happens? We've seen it time and time again in Acts up to this point. It happens over and over and over again. This is how it works. It's how it always has worked. This is good. But if he's the Lord of all people, then his church has to include everyone. So what can we conclude about what it looks like to be modern-day evangelists? How do we evangelize in a world where we're getting pressure and tension from every side? I think it's three really easy things. When you're sharing Christ with others, you have to be satisfied. All right? You can't lose hope. That's a big one. And you have to let God do the rest. You have to let him do the work that only he can do. And I get the tension that comes with that because when we pray and we don't get results, we don't get the things that we were hoping for, or we've been trying, you know, to to share our faith and do all the things we're supposed to do, but we're not getting the response that we hope for from people that we care about, we get discouraged. And I get it. I'm a preacher. I get that discouraging feeling. I want salvation to happen as quickly as Amazon can deliver a package to my house. I want a two-day guaranteed delivery. I preach, you respond, you have 48 hours to get a baptismal or I'm sending you back. I want it to be just as fast as that all the time. It's not how God works. It's not how people work. It's not how it works. One of the greatest leaders to ever walk the face of the earth is a man named Moses. And even if you don't know much about Christ or Christianity or faith, you've heard Moses. You have heard this man's name. Moses, the man that God gave all of his laws to, literally the foundation on which Judaism is built. That Moses, we call them the laws of Moses for a reason. Moses, who led God's people out of Egypt through countless trials in the middle of a desert in the hopes of coming into a land that was promised to them by God. If there was anyone who has ever walked the face of the earth who deserves to see the fruit of their labor, it was Moses. But guess what? Just when the promised land was so in reach, you could smell it. It was right there, the milk and honey that had been promised. God said to Moses that it will not be you who enters the promised land, but your successor, Joshua. Can you imagine trying to shield the disappointment that probably comes with giving your all to this thing because you were called by God and not actually get to see it all the way to the end? Can you imagine Do you imagine what our response would be? I can tell you what my response would be. Are you for real? Like that would probably, probably not to God because I'm afraid he'd spite me, but that would be my response. I have worked so hard. I have planted seeds all the way. I did everything you asked me. I'm so close and I don't get to go in. I don't get to actually see the harvest. I'd be very angry. You know what Moses' response was? That's okay. If it is your will, let it be. I'm just happy to be used by God. The blessing in Moses' life was, I'm just happy to be here. In the great symphony of life that God is orchestrating, just to be in the band was enough for Moses. Moses, the greatest leader who has ever led God's people, even the Old Testament said as much. No one has been as good as him. No one. There has never been a prophet like Moses since Moses. He's the best who have ever done it. And it was just good enough for him to be in the band, to be included in God's big plan. And if it's good enough for Moses, shouldn't it be good enough for us? 
Shouldn't it be good enough for you and for me just to be used by God? <laughs> just to be a part of it all? I might not be the most important one, but I'm here, and God uses me, and there's the blessing, there's the joy that comes with that. One of the things that a lot of church leaders, myself included, do is we're thinking about what evangelism looks like as we look to the future of the church, is we try to kind of look at some church trends. We try to look at some things that are happening, and there's a lot of, you know, think tanks and a lot of really great people who kind of pour their time and energy into kind of figuring out maybe what's next or, or just what we've seen in a trend. And if you have read any of these studies that have come out in terms of like church attendance trends, well, they're not positive. Let's just put it that way. We have kind of been on a downward attendance trend, the big church, like pre-COVID. And then COVID kind of accelerated that trend that was already happening. And we have a whole generation coming up that kind of identifies as like nons or non-religious or uns or people who are deconstructing their faith. Oftentimes they forget to reconstruct afterwards, but that's neither here or there. And there are a couple of responses that I have seen the church kind of play out over and over again when these conversations come up. And it usually goes like this, anger, finger pointing, and resignation, usually in that order. And it almost always starts with anger. We take a defensive posture and we say, what are you doing? You were not raised this way. You know better. You should be at church. You should be coming to church. What is wrong with you? Come on, get it together. That's usually where it starts. And then it goes to playing the blame game. You know who's at fault for this generation? It's parents. Parents, you're at fault because you stopped bringing your kids to church and that is on you. You know what it is? It's politics. You know what it is? It's your cell phone. You know what it is? It's sports. It's all the other things that you're doing. Instead of being here, it's your fault. And then it concludes with a resignation and just kind of like learning about a diet plan. You go, I'm out. Your loss. Hope it works out for you. None of these things, by the way, are biblical. <laughs> None of them honor God. In fact, all of those things are the opposite of evangelism and what we're called to do. We are the light of the world. <laughs> we are the hope of the world. So we can't afford to lose hope. And if a whole generation has given up on God, and we have given up on a whole generation, and if the grace of God isn't strong enough or sufficient enough to reach even them, then what are we doing here? What are we doing? You all already have Jesus. It's a beautiful day outside. You probably could be doing something else in here. What are we doing if Christ's love and his grace isn't sufficient which leads me to the most important thing you have to remember when it comes to evangelism. If the good news of Christ is for everybody, then nobody is out of the reach of God's grace. Nobody. Nobody. So have hope. Hold on to and cling on to hope. We are the hope and standard bearers of Christ Jesus. To be clear, the church is still God's plan for the world. Okay? That's not going to change, ever. It's still God's plan for the world. But maybe, just maybe, God is trying to do a new thing. And maybe, just maybe, in order to do a new thing, he's got to shake up some old things. Newsflash, wouldn't be the first time he's done it. When Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross, Matthew's gospel says that, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. This curtain in this temple separated the most holy part of the temple, the place where God dwelled and only the highest priest could go to, from everything else, the rest of the world. And the supreme significance of that moment was God saying, I have come to do a new thing. The old thing is finished, which puts the emphasis on it is finished and gives it a whole different light. It is done. That is done, and here is a new thing, and it features Christ Jesus. I'm doing something new. 
No longer do we need to have a separation between us. God has now full access. You don't need a temple to worship. God now resides in your heart. You don't need a priest to intercede on your behalf. You have the great high priest of Christ. And you don't need to sacrifice animals anymore because Christ gave every last ounce of his blood and it's more than enough. I'm doing something new. I don't know what the future of the church holds. I don't know. But I will tell you this. I'm along for the ride. Same. I want to be the kind of evangelist that doesn't make excuses for why I can't evangelize, why it's too hard. I already knew it was going to be hard. I want to be the kind of person who can be bold and strong in my faith because this world so desperately needs the good news that I have. They desperately need it. They don't always realize they need it, but they need it. They need it. So have hope. God is in the business of giving old things new life. He's really good at bringing things back from the dead. He excels in growing a harvest on what was once considered scorched earth. It's what he does. You know what we do? Our jobs until the day Christ returns is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody, with everybody, and let God do, do what he does best, which is to seek and save that which was lost. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for believing in us, for giving us the most important message the world will ever hear, that you've made a way out, that you give us hope. God, it's an important message, and it comes with a, a responsibility and a weight that sometimes feels overwhelming. God, give us what we need to be the kind of evangelists that reach out into our world and our culture with something so important for them, life-saving. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you have your communion elements, now would be the time to get those ready. I love this part always of our service time together because it's very rare that we just get to be still for a minute and know that God is who he says he is. He gives us a time to reflect on whatever God is doing in your heart and in your life right now in this moment. I love communion because it reminds me of where I find my strength. I know oftentimes people... <laughs> see me here on stage or you see this moment and it's usually a smile and energy and I think oftentimes there's an assumption that that's how it is all the time and I promise you, ask my family, it's not. Life is hard for me too. Things are not always great all the time for me. A long time ago, a mentor of mine said to me, what would it look like if you tried to live out the passage of scripture that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength? What would that look like, Phil, in your life? Would it look like having to let go of all of the things that I hold on to that are near and dearest to me to say yes to the fullness of Christ even if I don't know where I'm going next? Would it look like having the joy of the Lord be enough to sustain me when everything else I try doesn't sustain me? I think so. And I want that to be true for us. It's a hard world out there. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it's rough. People probably don't want to hear what you have to say. They probably don't care. They don't care about your God, your Christ. They probably don't. So you're going to need something to sustain you that is beyond that, beyond the praises of man, beyond the comforts of home. You're going to need something else. And the only thing in this world I've ever found that works is the joy of the Lord. It's my strength. Because I'm pretty weak. So the only way it works is if he sustains it, if he fills it. And isn't that the whole point of evangelism? Isn't that really what it is? Just saying yes to Jesus, letting him fill you, letting him use you, letting him pour you out, letting him fill you up again, rinse and repeat. We can do this. There is hope for this broken and depraved world. There is still hope. God is still on the move. He still wants to use us. If we'll let him. Today, when you take your elements, I want you to lean in to the everlasting promises of God. I want you to rest in the comfort of knowing that it's not you that does the transforming, but God that does it. You just have to be willing to go. 
And then when he does call you to go, I want you to walk forward in a boldness that says, I don't know where I'm going. I just know God's leading it. And that's enough. It's enough. It's enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this reminder of all that your son has done for this world. Give us what we need to be the light, that city on a hill that can't be hidden. Give us what we need. And we'll trust you to do the rest. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Stand and worship. Skin. 
I'm one of the elders here. Uh, isn't it wonderful to have sisters, youthful voices up here on the stage? Yeah. And also the rest of the worship team. I mean, they did a great job this morning. That, that brings me to a point. Uh, there's there's um, a form on the chairs next to you. It's a volunteer form. You know, we've been through a transition period here of over a year where uh, we've had great success from volunteers that have worked very hard. And now it's time that we need to step up and help those volunteers by letting them have a day off. So if you would prayerfully consider any of those activities that are listed on that form, and, and please, um, again, prayerfully do it. But then once you've filled out that form, if you would, take it out to the front desk, the welcome desk, and there's a box there that you can drop that form in. That would definitely be appreciated. The next thing is, there's a flyer for the end of summer cookout, which will be next Sunday from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, we would encourage you to come out and, and fellowship with one another, develop relationships. Uh, come anytime, stay as long as you can. There's also a suggested donation, and we'd ask that you would sign up online. Now, we come to that time where we have prayer, in our, uh, and we would love to pray with you. I see that Pastor Rob and his prayer team are back at the prayer wall. Uh, if you have a prayer request or a prayer of praise, please go see them. 
and we will pray with you. There's also, uh, on for you online folks, if you would uh, submit your prayer request or your prayer praise to your online host, that would be appreciated. Now, if you would, please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to gather and to worship you, to glorify your name, Lord. Lord, we praise you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you've given us. Lord, help us to be evangelists like Pastor Phil has challenged us to be. Lord, give us the opportunity, but also give us the right words to say and the right time. Lord, as we go through the rest of this week, we ask for your protection and your comfort, Lord. Guide us and direct us, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.